Hi everybody, welcome to the poetry vlog. Today's episode will be with Chen Chen, amazing, amazing, amazing poet who I actually learned about from a student, which makes them more amazing. Will you tell us what we talk about today, what people can expect from this episode? Yeah, um, we talked about so much. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of queer stuff. Um, yeah. We talked about a poem of mine that was um, recently poem a day, or not that recently. Um, and we talked about vulnerability um, and expectations placed on marginalized writers around um, writing your trauma. Uh, we talked about Home Alone. <laughs> we talked about queer family, queer kinship, um, and yeah, accountability. <laughs> yeah, all right, enjoy the episode, everybody. Welcome to the episode with Shen. Shen, will you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, so I'm Shen. And <laughs> I wrote a poetry book called uh, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Different Possibilities. And I just wrote this craft chat book as well, which is coming out from Sundress Publications. Oh, it's out now. Yeah. I think I saw that on social media, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, yeah they <laughs> had copies at AWP. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it'll be cool. available for download next awesome. week. Awesome. And okay. where can people find you online? Online, um, it's chenchenwrites.com, and that's C H E N C H E N W R I T E S dot C O N com. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I learned mm. about your work actually from having students go out and find a book of poetry they loved. Mm. And one student brought yours in, and I was like, I kind of love it too. That's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really pleasant. So go buy the book. And also craft essays are like gold mine for the other teachers who watch. So check that out as well. Mm. Will fun. you read for us? Yeah, so I'm gonna read a newer poem. Uh, this was published in Poem A Day, so you can find it online. Uh, it's called, I invite my parents to a dinner party. In the invitation, I tell them for the 17th time, the fourth in writing, that I am gay. In the invitation, I include a picture of my boyfriend and write, you've met him two times, but this time you will ask him things other than can you pass the whatever. You will ask him about him. You will enjoy dinner. You will be enjoyable. Please RSVP. They RSVP, they come. They sit at the table and ask my boyfriend, the first of the conversation starters I slip them upon arrival, how is work going? I'm like the kid in Home Alone, orchestrating every movement of a proper family, as if a pair of scary yet deeply incompetent burglars is watching from the outside. My boyfriend responds in his chipper way. I pass my father a bowl of fishball soup. So comforting, isn't it? My mother smiles her best, sitting with her son's boyfriend, who is a boy, smile. I smile my, hurry for doing a little better, smile. Everyone eats soup. Then my mother turns to me, whispers in Mandarin. Is he coming with you for Thanksgiving? My good friend is, and she went like this. I'm like the kid in Home Alone, pulling on the string that makes my cardboard mother more motherly. Except she is not cardboard. She is already exceedingly my mother, waiting for my answer. While my father opens up a Boston Globe, when the invitation clearly stated, no security blankets. I'm like the kid in Home Alone, except the home is my apartment, and I'm much older, and not alone, and not the one who needs to learn has to. Remind me what's in that recipe again, my boyfriend says to my mother, as though they have always easily talked, as though no one has told him many times. When a non-linear slapstick meets slasher flick meets psychological pit he is now co-starring in. Remind me, he says, to our family. I appreciated that. Mm. And I felt um, very deeply, I know a lot of people who watch this can respond to this well, mm. that sort of pain of needing to perform it in order to have um, mm -hmm. 
to be with your family, but yeah. then the way it becomes sort of like a contortionist play at the same yeah. time. That can be really painful. Mm -hmm. So thank you for reading that. Mm. And two questions. Sure. Um, first, why does it connect to what you want to talk about today? <laughs> and second, will we talk about Home Alone? Yes. <laughs> um, yes to the second question. <laughs> Um, and it connects to what I would like to talk about today um, in the sense that I've been thinking a lot about um, how do we get to those deeply vulnerable places in our poems, um, but also, I mean, just this issue of um, vulnerability and, you know, is it sort of expected yeah. of marginalized writers in particular, you know, sort of performing your trauma on the page um, as a queer writer, as a queer writer of color. Um, and so, you know, what do you sort of do with that um, expectation? Um, if you feel like you are writing toward some kind of um, vulnerability or difficult personal matter, um, but, you know, rendering that on the page for, for readers, um, or just for yourself, so. What does it feel like for you when people are like, how do you be vulnerable on the page? Like, when they ask you that, mm. like, how do you feel, mm -hmm. right? And then, because it's such a common question, why is mm -hmm. it something you still find yourself mm -hmm. pondering? You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like often behind that question of how do you... Uh, get so vulnerable on the page is uh, I think this assumption that in doing so uh, it's either this incredible act of courage and like willpower that just comes from somewhere deep inside innately yeah. um, or it's something that just pours out of you also very innately so it's either this challenge um, or it's you know just a matter of personality. And I think it's actually, some, and at least in my experience, something that's taken a lot of practice and a lot of trial and error of figuring out uh, what feels right to me, where it's a vulnerability that isn't um, too uh, exposing or exploitative in some way, um, but actually getting at a real concern and so to me, it always comes back to what are the real questions that I want to ask through the piece? And then it becomes an act not so much of representation, um, which I think, yeah, there's that burden of representation mm -hmm. that many marginalized writers uh, have to grapple with. Um, but it's, it's more a matter of discovery or it's a process of discovery. Yeah. Do you feel, this is going off script from what we planned for, so feel free to be like, yeah. no, thank you. But do you feel like, like, um, what, what's been coming up a lot for me when I chat with other poets, right, is everyone feels this pressure to make their poetry center those traumas mm -hmm. and center, like, pain mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, do you feel like it's, like, like, expected over you, or do you feel like you're kind of oftentimes forced to relive those types of traumas? Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to start from very small <laughs> yeah. places, uh, you know, a line, uh, a little image, an observation, and they often have nothing to do with anything super emotional. <laughs> you know, it might be something funny, uh, overheard in conversation, um, or just the way that a room looks, and I just want to start from there, um, and then slowly I'll discover the poem's true subject, yeah. and that often lead me to somewhere more um, serious and emotionally engaged yeah. and personal as well as political, um, quite often. So like with this poem, for instance, yeah. I was like, oh, it'd be interesting to have Home Alone <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. come into it. Yeah. Uh, I started from just this idea of an invitation um, to the parents um, and what would be sort of funny to like say in it, um, mm -hmm. like the RSVP part, um, mm -hmm. you know, including the picture of the boyfriend. Uh -huh. um, and, and then I just sort of see where that leads. Yeah. And it leads to that more difficult place. Um, but I let myself um, take some time. And then sometimes I'll revise it, mm -hmm. you know, where it'll get to that place a little more quickly if that's sort of the heart of the poem. Yeah. Um, but I try to 
be patient and try yeah. to take care of myself um, yeah. and not, yeah, put that pressure on myself so much. I'm really curious about the patience piece. So question one is about patience and then we'll get to home alone because we have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so patience, I guess I mean it um, mostly in terms of revision and also seeing revision as an emotional process mm -hmm. um, as much as a craft process where the questions that the poem is uh, pursuing will deepen over time. Yeah. Um, so that's also sort of what I mean by discovering the poems through subject. Um, so sometimes I think, oh, it's about this conversation that I had, but actually it's something behind that or it's something that led up to that conversation. Yeah. And I think in the past I used to be very impatient and feel like, because writing can be so difficult. Yeah. And so if I felt like, oh, I have this good idea, or like it's going in this good direction, mm -hmm. then I would just really want to get all of that down right away and also become sort of attached to that version. But now I try to, I think I'm, I'm a lot more flexible yeah. um, if things start to shift um, because I understand a little better that I'm getting to a more real place um, yeah. and um, the questions or the um, layers of emotion um, start to, they're revealing themselves to me yeah. um, rather than me kind of pushing it um, and trying to control the direction of the piece so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate that partly too because I think when people think about poetry, I talk about this a lot on the show as well, is they're afraid of it because they don't understand it, mm -hmm. which assumes that they have to understand it. Mm -hmm. I think, did you or someone else tweet about this recently? Maybe. I think I did yeah. say something. It was like, sometimes a deer is a deer <laughs> in a poem. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be this, yeah, riddle that you are yeah, decoding. The riddle. It was, yeah. All the time. It was yeah. that treating poetry like a riddle. Yeah. Which then oftentimes, because people are putting themselves into the poem, you're treating the person mm -hmm. like a riddle. Like it's mm -hmm. actually really violent. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like to be yeah. like, yeah, you have to, here's the poem, and you have to solve the riddle of what mm -hmm. it means. And because it represents this person's experience, you now have to like know this person's experience mm -hmm. and be like empathetic. Right, right, and right. it's like actually some people's experiences might be very opaque to you, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Right. Like you can care about someone's yeah. care yeah. without needing to know them. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's actually a very colonial important mm -hmm. <laughs> way of thinking. Yeah, ownership. Like, exactly, yeah. and mm -hmm. also like this is why I get like kind of irritated about empathy pedagogy. Mm. Because empathy presumes similitude, like you yeah. see yourself, and I'm like, that's yeah. so narcissistic. Mm -hmm. like, or that everything is supposed to be translatable. Exactly. As well. And then anything that yeah. isn't is erased, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or like is grounds yeah. for exclusion or right. erasure. And that is not as universal, <laughs> which is another exactly. term. Oh my gosh, my I like think... skin crawls actually yeah, <laughs> when, right. when people go with because what uh -huh. they're really saying is dominant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like things that I can identify yeah. with. And that is like, or when people say the human experience, right. you know, for me, what's exciting about poetry is that you don't have to get it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if you feel differently about that, but... Well, I'm just thinking about how often um, marginalized writers are kind of um, expected to perform within this binary of either triumph of, sort of overcoming yeah, struggle like, liberal, like individual right yeah. <laughs> or a uh, complete tragic mm -hmm. suffering like for instance with this poem um uh really how it came about was from a conversation with uh, my poet friend muriel young mm -hmm. um she's an amazing writer and we were talking over skype um and i was reading her a different poem mm -hmm. that i was working on and um, it was kind of from this other perspective where the speaker was uh, longing for returning uh, home to um, and interacting with, with the parents. And Muriel just said this great thing of like, oh, it doesn't need to happen in this poem, but what if you tried writing something where you flipped that interaction yeah. and the parents had to come to you? 
it came out of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, because I think that's the other thing when people ask me, like, how do you write about such personal or difficult subjects? As if it just comes out from, again, this like innate place. Like, <laughs> oh, yes, all the time. Yeah. But no, it's, it's born out of these dialogues, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, oh, I see there's another question that I could ask or another yeah. aspect or facet to this situation that I haven't quite considered before. Yeah. Um, and so then within the poem, uh, too, this and, and other ones I've been working on recently, um, I thought a lot about, well, how do you, because I, I just never see, um, you know, I rarely see um, depictions of marginalized people and marginalized communities working um, together and mm -hmm. for themselves, mm -hmm. <laughs> how we take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. um, because that, you know, the dominant gaze and like the white gaze and the heteronormative gaze is so, um, there's so much power, yeah. um, you know, where everything, you know, there's the immediate expectation that um, the piece is going to speak in that direction. Yeah. Um, and so it's important to me, like in this poem, where things aren't neatly resolved at the end, yeah. but at the same time, there's this moment of, oh, the speaker's partner, um, you know, interjects and, um, you know, directs the conversation in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that it's not just coming from the speaker, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's someone else, there's um, another presence in the poem, yeah. another source of, um, strength and um and yeah because i think that um tends to be the um expected position to be this individual suffering or this mm -hmm. individual triumphing yeah. over everything yeah yeah i did an episode way back with one of my mentors um sarah dowling so i have to plug her always because she's like <laughs> always taking yeah. care of me but we talked about what neoliberal multiculturalism is which mm -hmm. is jargony right so i was like can we break this jargon yeah. down because it's such an important mm -hmm. word because it's getting at that yeah. sort of dominant cultural expectation that we're all these like individuals who either um overcome all of our struggles mm -hmm. right to sort of uniquely stand out and triumph mm -hmm. which makes like the dominant sort of white and hetero and cis etc mm -hmm. folks feel comforted yeah because it's like oh well you could if you worked as hard as i did mm -hmm. right or mm -hmm. it's like completely subjected yeah. and like miserable which actually just once again comforts that dominant mm -hmm. gaze that it's like oh see i'm i'm not suffering yeah. so i feel bad for them i'll donate money mm -hmm. and that, you know and like the actual lived experience doesn't fit in either of those categories mm -hmm. Um, and it, and it's, uh, I think it's very powerful right now, actually in poetry that a lot of poems are pushing like your poem, right. Mm -hmm. To kind of make it a lot more complicated mm -hmm. than either narrative, yeah. but also readers are having to learn mm -hmm. how to be less like binary stick in their thinking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And actually and after this poem too, I realized, oh, I want to write more poems about queer friendships too. Because mm -hmm. I also didn't want to kind of privilege the couple form mm -hmm. um, as if like that's the end all be yeah, all, yeah. which is a very heteronormative idea yeah. of yeah. like, oh, that's who you depend on yeah. forever, always. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, no, there's Another so man, many, right? yeah, there's so many ways <laughs> yeah. that we hold space for each other and lift each other up um, and listen to one another. Um, and yeah, friendships have been so important to me. Yeah. All right, so. Home Alone, real quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just a heartwarming tale of botched burglary and <laughs> <laughs> family abandonment. Yeah, uh, yeah I... They should just put that on the DVD. Yeah. So now, like, a heartwarming tale of botched burglary and family abandonment. Yeah, because yeah. it's kind of horrifying. Yeah, I couldn't watch what it as happened. a kid, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the burglars go through a lot, you know, because he booby traps the whole house. Yeah. Uh, but also rewatching it with the particular scene that I reference in the poem, uh, where he's setting up this very elaborate um, whole system in the living room uh, in order to deceive the, the burglars. But I just, yeah, I kept thinking about, um, yeah, the way that family is um, like rejected and then reconstituted in that yeah. movie. Um, 
with that very neat ending of like, oh, and now we're home, and you missed us so much, and <laughs> everything's gonna be better now. Yeah. Uh, like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. when does he go to therapy? Right. And therapy? <laughs> like, that maybe it was weird that his family yeah. forgot it. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I can't. And because initially he yeah. was very happy with yeah. that situation. Yeah. But then because it was the holidays, yeah. so then he started to feel remorseful. <laughs> I feel like you're explaining to me why that movie has always stressed me out now. <laughs> it's it's like, a very stressful movie. Yeah, like, people would always reference it as just yeah. fun. And I, as a kid, was always just like, I can't this yeah <laughs> like, it's sort of horrifying but also kind of like inadvertently because it's so elaborate how he creates this whole other family um i think it, it kind of points to yeah. the constructed nature yes of um yeah biological family yeah. and um you know how do you sort of maintain uh essentially you know what is a facade yeah right of, yeah harmony and um that togetherness yes yeah. um but also like why is that such an ideal image of the home right yeah. so like this is a complete home um and and that title is just always so interesting to me like home alone that it's supposed to be mm -hmm. such a like alone as in like lonely mm -hmm. you know but in the first part of the movie again he's thrilled yeah. <laughs> to be by himself. Yeah. And I'm like, well, there's value in that as well. Mm -hmm. Like, home alone can be a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, That yeah. was when I got to, like, watch me. I, like, my family sometimes watches it and I feel like <laughs> that's its mm -hmm. own problem. But my little sister and I would, when my mom would, like, leave, we would, we weren't allowed to really watch much TV yeah. or listen to, like, non-Christian radio and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. So they would leave and we would throw away the bananas from breakfast because we didn't like bananas. And then we had to eat them. And then we would put on VH1 mm -hmm. and try to like dance. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like the most liberating two hours mm. of the week. You know what I mean? Because it was like, I'm going to try and learn how to like move my body in mm. like a sexy way <laughs> and like watch pop music yeah. like other kids do. Mm -hmm. Like being home alone yeah. was like the bliss yeah. time, you yeah. know? And we'd have like our 10 minutes of like rush cleaning everything up mm -hmm. and pretending we didn't have it. Like we changed yeah. the channel when we're turning off the TV. Yeah. You know, it was like this whole elaborate mm. thing. Yeah. So I think for me, with Home Alone, what was so curious to me about it is he went from celebrating to being like violated kind yeah. of, but then to like, right. it was just like such a like confusing matrix of yeah. like not what Complete I associate. Complete shifts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, that yeah. doesn't ever seem comfortable. Like yeah. no part of this yeah. movie makes sense to me. Right. It's like you're still practicing social norms. Exactly. Because like there's that one scene where he's shaving. Um, yeah. Or like kind of pretending to because yeah, he can't, yeah. he doesn't really have facial hair. Yeah. Um, She's also heartbreak. <laughs> yeah, but he goes through that ritual <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. oh, this is what you're supposed to do, hmm. um, you know, in this role. Or, like, the idea of, like, the man of the house. Yeah. Um, of like, oh, I'm supposed to, um, you know, take care of things, but yeah. in this dominant way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, control. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that <laughs> shape thing is a part of that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, mm -hmm. you're right, you're right. So to actually bring back what you also brought, because I'm glad you did, is that in terms of realizing with chosen queer family that you suddenly, the constructiveness of your bio family, mm -hmm. I feel like part of what's done for me is actually help create, like, especially through the, like, writing through queerness and poetry mm -hmm. with family, right? Like, my, my manuscript is almost all letters to family. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's realizing you can also choose to a certain extent. Yeah. How much you participate in that facade and how mm -hmm. much you don't and yeah. kind of regain some of your like mm -hmm. not agency in the yeah. individual sense but agency in terms mm -hmm. of like you're you have other spaces that it's safe yeah. so you can now make those choices right. with the bio family as well mm -hmm. mm. um, yeah and i think it's so important um yeah with queer community and queer spaces too not to assume safety um mm -hmm. and recognize that I mean, because there, there's this opportunity or there's this possibility, um, because I think there's this um, ex exposure of the constructedness, right, of um, bio family, yeah. blood family. It doesn't mean everyone's gone to therapy. But to yeah, therapy. it doesn't. It doesn't mean <laughs> yeah. like that, that. That's a starting point. Yeah. That's not an the end point. point. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, um, I think actually it's almost more hurtful when that yeah. ends up disappointing because yeah. there's the possibility moment. Right. There's You're all like, the hope. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's just like, 
oh no, mm-hmm. like this is what my dad did to me. Right. Yeah. But like I can't tell you that. Right. But I can't. It's like it's almost like mm-hmm. you have to create a new language mm-hmm. for creating boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like it's it's you know exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so with poetry, I'm just I'm increasingly interested in showing that process, showing that work. Yeah. Just had a flashback to like math class. Show your show your work. <laughs> <laughs> like, how did you get here? But I think it's, yeah. yeah, that's important. Uh, yeah. Because I think yeah, there can be this similar assumption yeah. of like, oh, like we identify in this way, and you know, we don't want to reproduce yeah. like these kind of patterns. But yeah, what is the the communication? What is the work that goes into ensuring that? Yeah. Um, you know, over and over. Yeah. Um, And how do we protect each other in those spaces, mm -hmm. right? Because Mm -hmm. I think that, like, it's good that in queer communities and in queer poetry communities especially, Mm -hmm. we want to, like, have each other's back and support each other. Mm -hmm. But it's, like, part of that is holding each other accountable, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And part of what I, like, love about poetry (laughs) is I feel like there's, like, tiny ways that people are held accountable in the poem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there have to be moments where you can identify your complicity or not, and certain things that can get called out in poetry. Yeah, that self-questioning. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being in conversation today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Um, And thank you everyone else for tuning in. The call for comments today is talk about your experiences with queer family and queer poetics. Um, and by queer poetics, I mean writing that has a hypertension to what it's doing is writing. Mm. Um, and uh, please buy Chen Chen's book and books, books plural, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, go to the poetryvlog.com to find the podcast version, social media. And if you sign up for the email newsletter, I will send you stickers and magnets because I really like sending snail mail and that's just my excuse. I love stickers and magnets. <laughs> I'm get stickers and magnets just for being on it. Awesome. <laughs> that's what the whole like add your mailing address I'm very, Oh. Yeah. I'll give you some today if you want. I'm thrilled. So I'm getting real multimodal this year. Wow. Yeah. But I love, love sending snail mail. Maybe it's projection because I love receiving it. Yeah. So I sign up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So sign up for mm-hmm. the newsletter and you'll get free stickers and magnets. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye.